Japan is a perfect example of why what we're experiencing and have been experiencing over the last couple of years is not inflation. It is quote unquote inflation in the form of consumer price acceleration and consumer price increases. But it's not the same thing as inflation. As Milton Friedman said a very long time ago, and he wasn't just throwing darts at the wall here, after exhaustive investigation of ec economies and systems all over the world, he said, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, which means the old adage, too much money chasing too few goods. But there are other situations when consumer prices can increase, even systemically, for what appears to be a sustained period of time, that is not inflation. It's not due to too much money. The problem that we have nowadays is that we look at March of 2020 and all the government interference, the Federal Reserve and everything else, and everybody says, well, there was too much money printing in 2020 and therefore consumer price increase, consumer price inflation by 2021. But no, there was no money printing in 2020. We have the data to back that up. And the consumer price increases in 2021 were about everything that you've heard. Supply shock. The lack of the, the inability of the global economy to respond to the rebound in demand, which was accelerated to a certain extent, probably a good extent, by government intervention. But that was temporary, transitory, because it didn't lead to the kind of money printing that would be necessary to turn a supply shock into actual inflation. And Japan as we went through yesterday, provides the perfect counterexample for why this isn't inflation. And Japan is experiencing now the consumer price shock that most of the rest of the world has experienced already. Now it's starting to seep into a wider variety of goods in Japan because up until just recently this year, the Japanese economy had been held back by coronavirus restrictions and advisements from the government, lack of movement, lack of economic um, flow through. But now that the Japanese are actually experiencing consumer prices, it's leading to all the sorts of problems that we see around the rest of the world, including the fact, as in the Japanese yen, there isn't enough money to sustain the price increases. So let's talk about inflation versus quote unquote inflation or supply shock today. Now, I'm Jeff, this is Eurodollar University, and I'm going to tell you, as I have recently, that if you're watching this video on Emil Kalinowski's YouTube channel, you're going to want to go to the Eurodollar University YouTube channel, which most people have already done. Thank you for that. Because at some point in the very near future, probably the end of this week, I will stop posting these videos on both channels and they'll be posted exclusively on Eurodollar University's YouTube channel. And you can always go to eurodollar.university, our website for information about what goes where, when, and why, and everything else that goes along with it, including subscriptions and memberships and everything else. If you're listening to me on Apple or some kind of podcast outlet, you don't need to do anything. Everything will be the same. So inflation versus quote-unquote inflation. To understand what I really mean, First of all, start with yesterday's video about the Japanese yen. Ja very simply, Japan had to pay for higher import costs because the supply restriction in oil and food and some other goods meant that Japan needed a whole lot of dollars. But Japan can't get the whole lot of dollars and has is, is having an enormous amount of trouble uh, securing those dollars because there aren't that many available. Contrary to popular to popular belief, the world has been experiencing a dollar shortage, not a surplus. I know bank reserve. we won't get into the bank reserves and all that stuff today. Let's go back in time to the 1970s, which was monetary inflation, and let's figure out the difference. Now, back in the early 70s, before 1973's oil embargo, oil-producing states were relatively poor. They had a very difficult time because oil prices were exceedingly low and investment was hard to come by. In fact, that's the reason we have LIBOR, uh, just to digress a little bit. 1969, um, banks, in, especially in London, in the euro dollar market, wanted to develop a way to allow these, these poor oil producers to, to at least be able to source euro dollar money and credit at a relatively decent rate. So they had to come up with essentially a benchmark rate to allow some of these poor oil producers to participate in the dollar credit expansion of that time. 
But then 1973, Israel war, OPEC, uh, OPEC institutes an embargo, oil prices surge. What happens? Well, what happens is suddenly oil producers, they flip positions with all of those countries that used to be importing, that still imports oil, but used to be paying almost nothing with, for them. So this is the, the 45th annual BIS report from 1975, which shows that oil exporting nations, they had um, reported reserves of about 3 billion, 4 billion in uh, 1972-73. So before the embargo, their increased reserves was a couple billion dollars, not all that much. But then in 1974, suddenly their, their combined reserves go up by 34 billion, when 34 billion was a hell of a lot of money back then. So they had very little funds, actual funds of their own. These are deposits, not loans. Uh, before 1972, 1973, so before the embargo. Then 1974, suddenly 34 billion. They're rich. They've got a lot of deposits, a lot of their own money. However, they don't need that, that money. They don't need loans anymore because they have cash coming in through economic means, large oil prices. And of that 34 billion, as the BIS uh, annual report says, the great bulk of their reserve gains was placed in the euro currency market because where else was it going to go? Most people think dollars means domestic or it means U.S. treasuries, but it actually did mean U.S. treasuries, but not inside the United States. They were sold mostly through London subsidiaries. So this money, these dollars, what people mistakenly believe is a petrodollar, it's not a petrodollar, Actually, it's the euro dollar functioning in the way it's supposed to be, in the way it's supposed to. Because all of this money that, that, got, uh, that ended up in the hands of these oil exporting nations came at the expense of oil importing nations. So when oil imports or when oil prices were exceedingly low in the early 70s, oil import nations were able to make a lot of money. They kept a lot of their funds because that's where all of the... Uh, the, ex, the actual economic and innovative growth through the global economy was going. But then oil prices shot up for not inflationary reasons. Oil prices shot up for supply reasons, the embargo, which then all of a sudden it's the oil exporting nations that have a lot of economic gains, income coming in through the export of oil. And here's where it becomes actually inflationary. Because after the, this redistribution takes place, um, before it had been, as I said, the oil exporting nations that didn't have a lot of reserves, then they did. Uh, of the oil importing countries, they had reserves of 20 billion in, uh, in reserve growth of 20 billion in 1972, 15 billion in 1973, but then just 1.8 billion in 1974. The situation has completely flip flopped. In order to pay for a lot more of the higher oil prices, to pay for all the oil that they were importing, they had to use a lot of their reserves or what would have been reserve growth. However, that risked shutting off the, the money and credit that would normally flow to the internal capacity of each of these oil importing countries' economy. But there was a solution there. That solution was redistribution of the euro dollar system. In other words, you have oil exporting countries that were taking in lots more dollars for the sale of oil. They then took those dollars. These are not physical dollars. I should make, make that absolutely clear. This is not physical money. These are all book entries. So they have an increase in book entries that we call deposits, but it's not physical deposits of cash. These book entries that are now in the hands of oil exporting countries that they leave in the euro currency market, the euro dollar system, on deposit with global banks, largely in run London, but also elsewhere uh, around the world, including Switzerland, of course. Now that these oil exporting countries have all these deposits, they leave them on deposit in the euro dollar market because the euro dollar banks that take in those deposits offer them competitive interest. And then they relend those funds to the oil importing countries, closing the circuit. So if you didn't have euro dollar banks at that time redistributing the, the, uh, the gains that oil exporting nations were, were getting from higher oil prices back to the oil importing countries, then the inflation or at least the oil price situation would never have been able to continue. The inflationary environment around the world wouldn't have continued because there was this credit creation 
that filled in the gap of monetary movement. Money that had been uh, oil importing countries, oil price goes up, now the money moves to oil exporting countries, depriving oil importing countries of that income so they at least are able to borrow back the deficit, which keeps the economy moving even though longer run, it leads to an impoverishing situation because now you've turned money flows into credit flows. But that never would have happened without the euro dollar system and the euro dollar bank standing in the middle to redistribute and close that glute that close that loop. And that's why in good part the 1970s was inflationary. Because as these oil importing countries were deprived of their money and resources to pay higher oil prices, which is one of the least productive economic, uh, economic developments you, that you can possibly imagine, there would be the, the economy in those oil importing countries would just grind to a halt and the, all, the whole thing would just turn into a recession, which would re rebalance everything the way it's supposed to go. It's only with the introduction of money and credit growth through the euro dollar channel that allowed the inflationary environment to flourish. Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Take away those euro dollar banks, take away that credit redistribution. Oil exporters would have been rich. They would have gotten more money for higher oil prices, but it would have been, dare I say, transitory. As it was in the 1940s. Uh, before we get to the 1940s, one last, I want to get to this quote here from Dr. John Carlick who was testifying for Congress, Congress's Joint Economic Committee. He was not just a Joint, Eco Joint Economic Committee senior economist. He was also a former senior economist at the Federal Reserve. What he told Congress in February 1977, just to put a finishing touch on our inflation is money story, the euro currency market provided a vital service in accepting large deposits from oil producing countries and lending the funds to hard pressed oil importing nations. Developing countries contending with increased energy and food costs and subsequently with a drop in earnings for their own commodity exports have been especially aided by credits obtained in the euro dollar market. Without the euro dollar market, without the introduction, the expansion of credit and money that the euro dollar system supplied, you just have a transitory supply shock. It sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Except the difference, as I showed yesterday, in Japan, but not just Japan, Japan is just one example among many, we don't have the euro dollar countries standing in between redistributing. Or what, what did Karlik say? Um, contending with increased energy and food costs, subsequently with a drop in earnings for their own commodity exports, have been especially aided by credits obtained in the euro dollar market. Not this time. The credits in the euro dollar market are hard to come by. And what have we seen? We have seen those commodity, those currencies crash. Those currencies go down as the difficulties in obtaining money and credits from the euro dollar system go way up. So in that sense, it's the opposite of the 1970s. We don't have the euro dollar channel to redistribute credit that is redistribute money that is now going to oil producers and food producers for unproductive reasons, non-economic reasons. We don't have the euro dollar system closing the gap, which is leading to all sorts of major issues, major money and financial as well as economic issues. You might have heard about them as we talked about a couple this week or last week, excuse me. We're going to talk about it again this week because Swiss National Bank, dollar swaps, very significant sign of global dollar shortage. Started out with $3 billion first week in October, nine counterparties. And last week, as I mentioned, we're up to 15 counterparties and $6.3 billion. And as of just a couple hours ago, the Swiss National Bank now tells us it's 17 banks bidding for over $11 billion. Global dollar shortage. We don't have the euro dollar system to close the gap of credit and money creation to make this inflation, which means that we're ending up in a situation that looks a lot like the 1940s. Now, in August of 1948, consumer prices had been high for a couple of years by then. And at one point in 1947, the CPI was rising at almost a 20% annual rate. 20% makes what we're going through now seem quaint. 
August 1948, Federal Reserve Chairman Thomas McCabe goes to Congress and tells them, we got to do something here. Because if we don't do something, this supply shock is in danger of becoming inflation. Sounds familiar. Sounds really familiar. Here's what he said in Congress. 1940, August 1948. In view of the pressure of current demands, the continued shortages of many goods, the limit capa limited capacity for out increased output, and the available accumula accumulations of liquid assets. <laughs> it sounds so damn familiar. Further credit expansion might add to the pr pressure for rising prices. It's like Jay Powell. I mean, he sounds exactly like Jay Powell today. We have a supply shock issue that if we don't do something about it, could turn into rapid inflation. It could turn into uncontrolled inflation. Thomas McCabe, Jay Powell, never seen him in the same room. Maybe that's maybe it's because there's 80, diff 80 years difference in between, 75 years difference in between, but they sound very familiar. Anyway, he said, we are convinced so long as the present situation lasts, it is important to restrict further credit expansion and to promote a psychology of restraint on the part of both borrowers and lenders. We got to do something or the supply shock becomes inflation. Now, what they wanted to do in, in 1948 was use the reserve requirements, which was a big taboo back then because of the 1937 experience. But either way, they thought we got to do something because this what is, wasn't inflation before could become inflation if we don't. But here's the thing. Congress approved the Federal Reserve's uh, uh, temporary authority to raise reserve, reluctantly said, you know what, consumer prices have been going up. You're right, there may be a danger that, that it's going to continue. Granted them authority. They used the reserve requirements in August of 1948, very sparingly though, but it didn't matter because the recession of 48-49, which officially began in November of 1948, so barely, barely months after the Fed started to move, we already saw the downturn in prices begin the month before McCabe went to Congress. Where is it here? I have in my notes. Wholesale prices had been, or consumer prices had been 9.9%. The CPI was rising at 9.9% in July of 1948. It was already 8.9% by the time Congress, or by the time McCabe went to Congress. And it was 2% by January 1949 because the recession was already underway. The supply shock had taken care of quote unquote inflation before it ever became actual inflation. In fact, there was really no danger of that actually happening. The Federal Reserve is always seeing monetary inflation where it isn't. And that's really the difference here. Without the money, you end up with a supply shock case like 1946, 1947, 1948 to 1949 which was a transitory supply shock inflation case. So even though it lasted from 1946 to 19, oh, two years, it was still transitory. And the Fed still thought it had to do something else the psychology crap would end up causing more problems than it did. But as we see in the contrast between say Japan or India or some other countries around the world today versus the 1970s, if you don't have the euro dollar money credit in between to redistribute cash flow back in the direction from where it came, think of what Carlick said, 1977, without that money, you end up with something like the 1940s, which, is, which ends also very familiar with monetary shortages, credit disruptions, financial instability, and economic recession which is kind of the situation we're facing right now, especially the Federal Reserve, which says we better do something about it because we have no idea what we're actually doing or what we're actually looking at. That part hasn't changed. People don't realize that this, this invention of a modern Federal Reserve, a capable technocratic institution, is, as I said, a very recent modern invention. The Federal Reserve, throughout most of its history, it's been a very tortured history. Money is inflation. And what we see around the world, not just today, but especially today, over the last year and a half, it's not what they said. It's not a surplus of money. It's a shortage. And also one final point, what did the U.S. dollars exchange value do against all these other currencies back in the 1970s? 
The dollar was way down against these other currencies that went way up. Today we have the dollar going way up, all the other currencies going way down. So even if we can't see what is happening in the monetary system directly, just the currency direction tells us a great deal about what's really going on monetary. No money, no inflation. That simple. That doesn't mean we don't have lots of problems. It just means we have very different problems than what many people are expecting. So those are what we have to deal with moving forward. And again, acceleration in issues in Switzerland, not a good sign on that account. Currencies, Chinese yuan, Japanese yen, all the rest, not a good sign there. There's a lot that history can teach us about what we're going through now. It's just that most people don't know the history and most people don't know the monetary system either. So thank you for watching. As always, I'm Jeff from Eurodollar University. Check us out at eurodollar.university for memberships. Always a, a special thank you to Eurodollar University members. We'll scroll some names at the end of this at the end of this, uh, the video here. And uh, subscriptions, research products, all that kind of stuff. All the information available at eurodollar.university. Until next time, take care.